Carolyn, hi, welcome everybody. Howdy, howdy. I know, Bob, before you leave, um, we have, I don't know if we were on when we did um, the talk and, and we said something about Deepak Chopra is doing his love in action. I looked it up, I wanted to tell you before you left, um, Bob has to leave early. If you look up neveralone.love, he's doing a, um, a grass uh, roots movement uh, on emotional distress uh, in the world and people and, and he has a GoFundMe campaign. And I think you would really, I'm gonna talk about it later, but I think you really would um, like hearing about that. Thank you. All right, we're just going to give another couple of minutes. Carolyn, how are you doing? Doing good. Doing good. <laughs> painting outside, painting flowers. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, beautiful. Wow, Doesn't that kill them when you paint them? <laughs> no, not when you put it on a patio. I'm painting the flowers on a patio. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, it would suffocate them. <laughs> and Michael, I think Nancy and Chris are supposed to come on today. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's Michael's sister, my best friend. <laughs> and oh. I, yeah. I actually texted them to remind them. <laughs> but that doesn't say too much. <laughs> Yes, anything could happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we don't have Jane yet. Let me text her. Oh, where's Jane? I mean, this is she's woken up by now. I yeah, know. No excuses from Jane. I know. Well, now it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can we can start, um, Jane. I'll just text her. Okay. okay. All right, well, she'll catch up with us. I don't want to, I want to be mindful of everybody's time here. And whoever is supposed to be here will be here. <laughs> so I will do my thanks to Carolyn. Oh. <laughs> everyone for coming. I'm so glad to see you, even if it is on Zoom. Glad to touch base with everybody. So we'll start with the opening, opening music. Everybody. I'm going to mute everybody. If you need to speak, please unmute yourself. Okay.
Kathy, you need to unmute. Uh, there you go. We did it. Okay. So as always, we start everything with a spiritual mind treatment. So we just take a breath in. And this is what I know. There is one presence, one power that I call God, spirit. This presence is the underlining reality for everything, everyone and everywhere. God is the ultimate creator, all love, peace, harmony, and grace. Spirit is eternal and changeless. I live in the spirit of truth, and I am conscious that the spirit of truth lives in me. I know, and I know that I know. We are one with God. Spirit animates everything that we do, say, or think. We are a center in the divine mind, a point of God conscious life, truth, and action. Because we are this God in form, our lives are truly blessed with love. Love for ourselves and love for those around us. Self-love, which replaces any negative self-talk. We have more than enough of everything, and that includes time and energy and money and opportunities and freedom and health and joyful relationships. And from the top of our heads to the bottom of our toes, all our cells and systems are working perfectly, especially our strong immune systems. Our world is surrounded in peace and our politicians govern from love. Our deep faith allows us to know that everything and everyone is always in divine order. God is in the fires, in the storms, in the health opportunities, the equal rights for all. All is God and all is well. And my words are God's words and they are powerful and complete. And I'm so very grateful for the opportunity to simply stop. Stop and remember who we are and for the wisdom that resides within each one of us. Grateful for each other and for the love and the faith that surrounds our lives. Thankful for health in the air and our lives being wrapped in peace and equality and for knowing that anything that is not in alignment with this is released. And so with hearts filled, I release this into the allness of life, back into lore, knowing spirit is the life that lives us, the wisdom that guides us, and the love that keeps us. And so we say together, and so it is. And now our identity prayer. I know that within myself, there is a life which is perfect, complete, and divine. It was never born and it cannot die, for it lives and is God. Within myself is wholeness, peace, poise, and the power of life. This life is health, it is abundance, and it is love. There is one life and it is the life of God. And this is my life now. And so it is. And before I introduce Michael, I just wanted to read a poem from Ernest Holmes. And it's She Let Go. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, but I love it. She let go. Without a thought or a word, she let go. She let go of fear. She let go of judgments. She let go of the con confluence of opinions swarming around her head. She let go of the committee of indecision within her. She let go of all the right reasons, wholly and completely, without hesitation or worry, she just let go. She didn't ask anybody for advice. She didn't read a book on how to let go. She didn't search the scriptures, she just let go. She let go of all the memories that held her back. She let go of all the anxiety that kept her from moving forward. She let go of the planning and all the calculations about how to do it just right. She just let go. She didn't promise to let go. She didn't journal about it. 
She didn't write in a projected date in her day timer. She made no public announcement or put no ad in the paper. She didn't check the weather report or read her daily horoscope. She just let go. She didn't analyze whether she should let go. She didn't call her friends to discuss the matter. She didn't do a five-step spiritual mind treatment. She didn't call the prayer line. She didn't utter a word. She just let go. No one was around when it happened. There were no applause, no congratulations. No one thanked her or praised her. No one noticed a thing. Like a leaf falling from a tree, she just let go. It was no effort. There was no struggle. It wasn't good. It wasn't bad. It was what it was. And it is just that. In the space of letting go, she let it all be. A small smile came over her face. A light breeze blew through her. And the sun and the moon shone forevermore. That's from Ernest Holmes. And now I just want to introduce Michael, my, Dr. Michael Rogan. And I'm sure everybody is familiar with the last time Michael spoke on, on Buddhism. So Michael's here again now to talk on mindfulness. And Michael works as a neuroscientist and a psychotherapist and is the founder of a digital health company devoted to supporting people who have serious illnesses. His published works include research on emotion learning and memory, as well as a handbook for healthcare workers on integrating mindfulness techniques in clinical practices. Michael has his PhD in neuroscience from NYU, and he has been a Buddhist teacher and a mindfulness teacher. And he's a good friend of mine. His sister is my best friend. So I've, I've known Michael almost all his life. <laughs> and he can't get rid of me. He's stuck with me now. That's right. <laughs> so welcome, Michael. I'm so glad you could join us again. Thanks. It's good to be here. Can you hear me OK? Uh-huh. All right. Um, I believe we're going to begin with uh, a bit of meditation practice, a bit of mindfulness practice. So I'll begin by giving some instruction and uh, make, it, uh, make it clear in general, I think it's always worth mentioning that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm giving you this talk and this teaching as a, um, someone who participates in a lineage of teaching that stretches back to the Buddha, Shakyamuni. I am uh, authorized to teach this stuff. And part of what um, being authorized to teach in my lineage means is that I'm trusted to teach what I know and not to talk about what I don't know. So this is going to be as clear as I can make it and as simple as I can make it. Uh, even within a single, even within Buddhism and even within Buddhism, within a single lineage, mindfulness has many, uh, can be talked about in many ways. And that's because there is a, uh, a distinction between path and fruition. The same word mindfulness is used to describe the path which is the way that you do, the thing that you do, the practice, the method, the, te the technique. And the same word is also used for the fruition, which is the result of the technique. And that is also called mindfulness. And when you hear mindfulness talked about, sometimes it isn't clear what, whether people are referring to the technique or to the result. And it's really different because the technique, as any technique, has a deliberate quality to it. You're doing something on purpose for a reason, and you're exerting a little effort, 
And there is a sense of I'm doing this because I want a result, right? Uh, whereas the experience of mindfulness as a fruition has no deliberateness and has no goal and is not about a result or moving in a direction towards some end. It's an end in itself. So this can sound contradictory if you don't have the distinction between mindfulness as a technique and mindfulness as a result of technique. So now we're going to do technique. I'm going to talk to you about the technique. We are uh, going to, uh, mindfulness as a technique is corrective about an over-involvement in mental activity, that we tend to think a lot, we tend to conceptualize our experience, narrate our experience, project into the future about stories, make conclusions based on the past, relive things. All of that mental activity is, in its essence, useful, but it tends to be overdone. It tends to be uh, considered uh, of an exaggerated importance because thinking is not really that important. It's sort of a, a way of getting things organized, you know? But we have a tendency to live in our thoughts as though our thoughts were our environment. And mindfulness is a technique to specifically disrupt that habit of ceaselessly generating thoughts and concepts and then living inside of those thoughts and concepts as though they were the real world and that more thoughts and concepts are needed in order to keep everything going, you know? So the reason, the way that mindfulness addresses this, and this is the beginning of the instruction for our meditation now, is to place our attention on our physical sensations. So this method uh, among all the many methods of mindfulness has a shorthand, it's called placement. This is about placement, mindfulness through placement of attention. You can put your attention anywhere you want. If I told you to pay attention to this thing here on the wall behind me, you could do it. You know, you could put your attention there. You can devote your resources, your processing resources to something because you choose it. But our attention can also be captured by events in the world that are not chosen. And that's a very helpful thing. If there was an explosion outside, it would capture my attention because it's important and I want to actually know what's going on there. And, you know, it's useful to have our attention be captured. But what tends to happen is our attention gets captured by thoughts that have an emotional charge. And then our attention gets captured and then we get caught in our thoughts. Um, so, but no matter what, we're always able to place our attention, right? We can do it. And so in mindfulness, I place my attention on my physical sensations. And I can choose an object of mindfulness, which could be the sounds that are happening around me, or it could be the physical sensations of the breath. And we'll use the breath for now, the sensations in as I breathe, all of my sensory nerves are active and firing away. And I can notice sensation in my nose, in my mouth, in the back of my throat, in the movement of the chest and the abdomen as I lift and open the rib cage, push the diaphragm down, bring the air in. And then as I relax and let the air come out, I feel that those sensations. And it's important that you feel the sensation, not picture some image of the air going in and out, 
or I think about the breathing or, you know, the yoga stuff like, you know, blue light in and white light out and all of that stuff. We're not talking about that at all. We're talking about the actual activity of the peripheral nervous system as it responds to the movement of the air and the muscular exertion around the breath. So Kathy, you're not muted. So tell me when you feel the breath, where do you notice it? Where do you notice the sensation? Um, in my nose and in my stomach. Uh-huh. And in your stomach, what do you notice? Uh, what kind of sensation is it? It's uh, my stomach goes out and I feel a coolness come in. Come in through the nose? Yeah. Right. So the sensation in the, in the belly, in the stomach, is one of actual pressure. It's like movement of the body right? And that is a particular sensation. Coolness of the air entering the nose or the mouth is also a sensation. It's really important that this be sensation, right? So Kathy, you gold star, you got it right. <laughs> and the reason why mindfulness is effective in this way is our sense, feeling our sensation is our ticket to the present moment because you can only feel your sensations when they're happening and they're happening now. So as you breathe in and feel the coolness in your nose, you are in the moment. There isn't, you can't feel at any other time, any other place. It's in your nose and it's happening now and you're feeling it. So if you ever wondered what's it like to be in the present, all you have to do is feel your sensations and you are in the present because the sensations only happen in the present. They can only be felt in the present. Now, the fact is we tend to have a flickering uh, ability to really feel it as it is current, you know? We feel it for a moment or two and then we're like, oh, oh I'm not feeling it and then I feel it again, you know? That, that's what happens because our minds are wild and get captured with cognitive activity. But for now, in this practice time, just for the next uh, five minutes or so, we're just going to uh, let the body rest. You don't need to, uh, when I say rest, I mean no, you don't need any extra tension or holding in the body. It's not about falling limp. It's just about being awake. It has a certain muscle tone, but not extra. You let the shoulders rest on the rib cage, which is where they normally rest in the soft tissue above the rib cage. And I let the breath come in and out in a regular way. I don't need to manipulate my breath. I've been breathing all this time. I know how to do it just fine. But I would, the only extra deliberate action here is to place my attention on the sensation of the breath. So I feel it. And if I notice that I'm not feeling it, just right away, just feel it again. It's always happening. We're still breathing. The sensations are still occurring. It's just about placing your attention again. So we'll do this for a few minutes now without any more talking.
And now for the next few minutes of this practice, I'm going to suggest uh, that you let your eyes open and practice with eyes open. This is an awake, alert practice. This is not about drifting off somewhere. This is being right here where you are, on that couch, on that chair, in that room, right now. There is no need to shut anything out or to have your attention be narrow and exclusive. I feel the breath, but I also am aware of other sensations as they occur because I'm alive and there's lots of sensations happening. They're all happening in the present. The different sounds, the pressure of my body against the chair where I'm resting. And I feel the sensation of the breath also. And I just let my eyes rest open. Awake means open eyes. Close your eyes when it's time for sleep. And just let the light come in to my eyes. I don't need to work and look and push with the eyes. Just let the light come inside my eyes and feel the breath. So as we continue for another few minutes, this is intended to be under all the thoughts. This is before the soothing thoughts, the corrective thoughts, the ideas and the images, all of this language about health and spirit and positivity 
This is under all of that, before that happens. What is direct? Before the thinking starts. And I access this by feeling my sensations and resting. Letting the mind rest also. One more minute. Now as this practice time ends, we don't need to make a sharp transition. Just start paying attention to each other's faces on the screen. Kathy, can you stop sharing so we all can see everyone at once on the screen? There you go. Ah, there we are. Now we're all here. Okay. And it would be helpful to, if you have a video available to turn it on. You can take a moment to do your hair if you must, but go ahead. And turn it on if you can. I know I have to do my hair. It's really long now in lockdown. Can't be a, a wild therapist on video. <laughs> So I want to ask um, what that was like, and is that, would anyone like to uh, tell me about that experience? We're going to proceed now by this way, by questions and answers. Unmute yourself if you wish to speak. Kathy, you raised your hand. It was very different. It was really different with your eyes open. Very different. It wasn't I don't want to label it bad or good. It was just very different, you know? Mm. And it, it's nice because it gives me a chance to do this when I'm in my life instead of closing everything out. It really is, it was a very good um, teaching, teaching for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has practical advantages. Like you say, it makes it more portable. Yeah. You can do it while you're waiting for the light to change. Yeah. You don't have to, but it's also in principle, it's, <coughs> it's very basic that mindfulness is about being open to everything that's happening. So to deliberately shut off things, sensory avenues is just the wrong idea. It's, it's not what you do. It's not what you do. Now, Sometimes people find eyes open hard. They have sort of a difficult experience. Did anyone find it s sort of less easy with the eyes open? 
somehow that there was a, a feeling of difficulty around it? I, I, yeah, go ahead and start talking, whoever does. Um, well, I, I've always, I guess, thought of my influences necessarily maybe just focusing on the breath when you were talking about paying attention to other sensations, like sitting in your chair, that was kind of uh, broadening for me. I mean, because part of my spiritual practice is to not be dependent on any person playing. Up, oh, you froze well, for you a second. Do it wherever you're at. Say, say what you just said again, because you froze for a moment. Uh, I'm not sure where I froze at. Um, <laughs> Part of, part of not my being story, dependent, not being dependent on other, on things. On any person, place, or thing. Like, like Kat yeah. was saying, it's, it's, it's being, it's that, that's portable. You can bring it with you wherever you're at, uh, bring this sense of peacefulness, which is what I experienced in yeah. focusing on the sensations and not letting thoughts run away with me. There's something interesting about this as a technique and the fact that the breath is often used. Now, the breath is used in many ways in many kinds of techniques within Buddhism and in other ways. But in mindfulness, one of the things that I was told by my teacher when she gave this to us was, uh, it's not about the breath. The breath will reveal nothing to you. It's about being present. And the sensations of the breath is a way to be present. For some people, now this is no longer her talking, this is me. For some people, the breath is not a good object of mindfulness, is not a good place to place attention. If you have a lot of anxiety, the breath is a particularly not a good place because we tend to feel our anxiety in our breath. And we can become more and more sensitive to our anxiety level by feeling the sensations of the breath and how tight it is and how short it is and all of that. So there's nothing obligatory about the breath at all. Um, for certain people, the breath is not good as an object of mindfulness. For opera singers, it's not good because professional singers have spent their life training their breath in a very deliberate way and it's very hard for them to have an unmanaged breath, a breathe, breathing where they're not exerting control over it, you know. And the idea of a sensory object of mindfulness is that it not be controlled. It's something that's just happening and I'm noticing. Um, so for many people, sound is the best entry. You just notice the sounds around you and place your attention on the sound. And no doubt you will also notice the chair because once you're present, all the sensations are present too. And so you will notice the chair and you will notice your breath and you will notice maybe an ache and a pain here and there. You know. But the idea of placement is to what do you do in order to uh, allow yourself to be present is you place your attention on some sensation. You just pick one, like the sound or the breath. And then once your attention is there and you're actually feeling the breath, all the other sensations are available to be felt too. Everything that's happening now is noticeable and you, you begin to notice it all. So it's not about having a narrow, tight focus on your breath. It's just using the object of mindfulness as the thing that you find sort of easy. And you just use that as the thing you do. And then once you do it and you're feeling it, then you're in the present for however long that lasts. You know. How did, uh, what did people notice about how long they were feeling the breath, for example, how long, how long of a duration did they have a real uninterrupted sensation of the breath? I, I found that with my eyes closed, I had very little difficulty feeling the breath, but as, 
like you said, as soon as I opened my eyes, it's like the thoughts came back in. There, there was, I could see the screen, there was some flashing on the screen and there was like more distraction to set off. It was much easier when my eyes were closed. Uh-huh. Distraction's a good word to explore. In, in mindfulness practice, no sensation is a distraction. All sensations are in the present. All sensations are in the present. Doesn't matter how many there are. Doesn't matter what they're doing. But, but the thoughts are distractions because they are the thing that you do instead of feeling your sensation. Uh, your attention gets captured by the thoughts. Now, thoughts that just come and go and they're in the background and they just have the life of their own don't interfere with practice. And there is nothing about this that requires that thought processes stop. And if you have the impression that thought processes are stopping, you're probably exerting yourself too much. It's, it's not necessarily a good sign. You know, there was one teacher who I really like, who uh, someone recounted this experience <clears throat> that when I um, when I place my attention on the breath, my thoughts stop. I notice that my thoughts become silent. And the teacher's response was, that is an indication that your placement is too strenuous. Because there's no problem with the thoughts just having their life and coming and going. It's about what is grabbing the spotlight. What is, what is really takes you away, you know, thoughts can take you away. But if you, the proper placement is very light touch a touch. If you think about the breath, the air is really touching you. And all you want to do is feel that touch in the nose, in the throat, or the touch of the muscular movement. It's as light as possible, as light as could possibly be. So, so you're, you're trying to be present to the sensations without being carried away by the thought. Because what I find is, I, it happens, I mean, it doesn't just happen now, it happens frequently where I'll be doing something then all of a sudden, a few minutes later, I'll real, I'm, I'm somewhere else. Oh, totally, exactly. And I'll, so, and I'll bring myself back and then I'll go somewhere else after that. Right, that's how it works. That's how it works. That's the situation we're in, where our placement will only last for a certain amount of time, often fractions of a second, not, just, not even a second, you know? It could just be a fraction of a second. That doesn't, that's not a failure. That is just a, uh, an expression of how wild the mind is, and that's where we are at. Where we've got a wild mind. And this is the area of uh, practice that's referred to as taming, taming the mind. And what gets tamed is not the mind itself in terms of, well, I won't say what it doesn't do. What, what gets tamed is the habitual activity of the mind, the chatter, the tumbling, the rolling from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. That is, you know, the activity gets tamed. The stuff that is not chosen, but just sort of keeps happening. Like you're saying, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm thinking of that now and I'm not doing what I was doing and I was intending to do it. Um, that's the part that we want to tame and taming takes some deliberate activity and mindfulness as a technique 
is a way of taming that unwanted, unneeded, sort of accidental habitual activity, which if it is not tamed, can occupy you for the rest of your life without a pause, right? That is what is called suffering. Because it is very hard to be nourished in the activity of the wild mind. It's very hard to be connected with others in the activity of the wild mind. It doesn't have room for that. So none of us experiences a completely wild mind or else you would not have attended something like this. You would not have become interested in something like this, which is different from the conventional experience of life, right? But we all have uh, more wildness than we're quite comfortable with. Otherwise, we'd be off doing our peaceful thing and we wouldn't be attending classes, you know, we wouldn't be looking. Um, does think, anyone else have any other, go ahead, what were you saying, Tom? I think the, the Course in Miracles says something to the effect that we're far too tolerant of mind wandering. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things uh, I've heard in my tradition too, which is, you know, people, think that they're not patient enough to do mindfulness practice. But the problem is, just as you said, we're patient, we're very patient with the wrong things. We're endlessly patient with tripping down the same stair in our mind over of habitual soothing that works for a second, but then leaves us a little queasy, you know, we're very tolerant of confusion and chatter and very patient with our wildness. And uh, we can choose not to be. So the purpose of mindfulness really as a technique is to just try to break through for a moment of awareness of what it's like to not be fully carried away by the chattering wild mind. And then to notice that, oh, actually that's desirable. That's like, I want, I want more of that, you know? And though it may sound uh, paradoxical to sort of activate desire and, you know, as a way of moving on the path, the fact is we're just stuck with being motivated by desire all the time. So may as well desire something good. So uh, we'll pick this one. And if you get an experience, even if it's very brief, the body wants it, you know, the mind will want it. And so you will try, it's, it makes it more likely that you're going to, uh, Notice when it's not there, notice when it's there, and prefer to have it there than not there. So any other, any more questions or comments about? When you have a, a situation where an incident, uh, probably an emotionally charged incident, dominates your thinking, you keep playing this tape over and over and over. You think, I'm so tired of this. How, what are some steps you can take to stop this? Sure, good question. And uh, it's a situation we find ourselves in to a greater and lesser degree, you know, 80% of the time. It okay. doesn't need to be some intensely intense thing. It's even more disappointing from a, uh, from a Buddhist point of view to be occupied by trivial things nonstop, you know? Mm -hmm. At least if it's a big thing. <laughs> There's some reason why you're getting hijacked, yeah. you know, but when it's a, when it's a big thing, it's, um, it can be harder to deal with. So 
this practice is intended not to be used in intense states. This isn't a fire extinguisher practice, right? This isn't about wait till you're going crazy and then try to be mindful as a remedy for being crazy. <laughs> this is intended to be to do when it's easy to do, when your mind is relatively, when you have energy, when you're sharp, and you become more familiar with what it's like to have your mind hijacked by these smaller things, these less intense things, and then what can you do? Then you can place your attention again. And you begin to get experience with having real agency about what actually goes on with your mind and where your attention is, and that you don't need to merely be blown around by the wind of these things that are occurring, you know, either in the world or in your mind. You can actually have some choice about where you put your attention. But I will give you a fire extinguisher practice, which is um, built upon mindfulness practice, which is done hopefully daily for a period of time each day as a way of becoming more and more familiar with how the mind works and how these things happen. It's easier to develop a, um, a, uh, the muscle of placement when there aren't big things going on in the mind. Like when you go to the gym, you don't try to lift 400 pounds all at once. You don't have the muscle to do it. And actually straining at it will develop your muscles a little, but it's not so much fun. It's better to use a lower weight that you can actually lift, and then you move on to the higher weights when the time comes. So that's the reason why the, the daily practice, which is builds the skill, builds the muscle for doing this. But if you are um, having uh, these intense thoughts that really capture you and you're stuck with them, uh, that's a good example to explain a little further. So there are two parts to mindfulness. One is placing your, placing your attention on the sensation so that you feel the sensation. And the other is when you notice that you're thinking, right away you feel the sensation, right away. You don't need to talk to yourself about it. You don't need to make a decision. You don't need to like go to the breath, you know? The breath is right there. You didn't go anywhere. It's still you, you're still breathing, you know? This idea of like, go back to the breath, I think can be a little, uh, it's overly elaborate because you don't have to go back anywhere. You didn't go anywhere. You're still breathing. Your lungs didn't like depart and are somewhere else and you've got to travel across the room to get back to your lungs so you can breathe. It's all about mind. It's already there. You just feel a breath right away. So like right this second, I'm telling you, you can feel your breath. Just feel your breath now, everybody. You don't have to do much. You don't, it doesn't take much. And you want to get familiar with how easy it is to do. It's instant. It's a flash. It doesn't need to, doesn't need preparation. It doesn't need, um, you don't need to explain it to yourself again, why I'm doing this. Oh, now I have to go back to the breath because I'm doing mindfulness and mindfulness is about feeling the breath. Now, I certainly recognize that everyone goes through those narrations anyway, you know, it takes some doing, but you just want to know that it's not needed. Even now, you may find yourself habitually explaining things to yourself and narrating what you're doing with your mind, but those narrations are not needed. It's simple enough that you just do it. You just feel the breath. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't require much. So those are the two parts. And even if the thoughts are very intense, you can feel the breath for a fraction of a second. And it may take you right back. It may take you right back. But that's the nature of it. That's the nature of it. Then you feel the breath again, just for a fraction of a second. Um, when the mind is very busy, like you're describing, Sylvia, you may want to introduce a more busy practice. 
in order to hold the more busy mind. So one way of doing that is the, the next level of busyness is to apply a label to the thought. And you can just say, thinking, thinking, I'm thinking. So when you notice that you're caught up in the thing, you can just say thinking. And then often there'll be a little bit of a gap after you label it. And what that does is acknowledge that there's something happening here, but it doesn't get yourself into the sticky content of what the thought is because it doesn't matter. Mindfulness doesn't care what's in the thought. It's, you know, it's just a thought, just like any other. Just like the thought that I have to go back to my breath is just a thought and isn't needed. The thought about the lawsuit or the landlord or the relationship or the partner is also, it doesn't matter what the content is. It's just a thought. For now, for this period of time, for the period of practice, it's just a thought. And so you develop this ability to recognize that thoughts do not deserve to dominate your experience. You get to think about things when you want, when you want to, when important things happen, they capture your attention. But part of this is a recalibration over time so that the intense, the intensity of the thought gets reduced and becomes more like information rather than a gun pointed to your head, you know, that kind of intensity where you have no choice and you're completely driven by the content. That extra intensity is an error, you know, and part of the trouble with our minds is important things can capture our attention but we can consider certain things important when they don't really deserve that importance. You know, we can make mistakes and, you know, relive the, our most embarrassing moments every once in a while, way over, you know, totally over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, completely over, no impact anymore, but still they can come to the mind as some vivid, yeah. important thing that has to like, that takes over. Who just said yeah? I did. Oh yeah, tell me more. Yeah. That was Sylvia. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you see, it's not so easy to uh, assert control. You can't really do surgery on your mental events and take out the ones you don't want and replace them with ones you want. It doesn't work that way. That would be good. It would be good, but it's also, you know. Uh, it would depend on your good judgment, which would also be a mistake. Like, what do you know about, you know, your, the, the, the drunk, crazy person would be doing the surgery. And so it's actually not so good because there isn't any real. Uh, so I think maybe the last, but the last thing I'm going to talk about is to give you a sense of hopefulness about how this works in that specific uh, idea of how do I know what to do and that would be good for me, you know, because I'm the one who is having all this confusion. So what good is it for me to be exerting myself? And isn't that just going to lead to more confusion? And my experience has certainly been that it tends to lead to more confusion when I'm behind the wheel because I don't necessarily know where I'm going and I don't necessarily know my motivations. And I have a very imperfect, you know, uh, clarity about things. One of the reasons why mindfulness can promote clarity, which means that, which means an unbiased view a view that is not dominated by past experience, 
by expectations of what happens. Oh, and now this is going to happen because I know who this person is. I never met them before, but now I know who they are. They, uh, they're that kind of person and they're going to do this. Clarity involves a more clear view of being present for what's actually unfolding at the moment. And as you can imagine from what I've said already, mindfulness is really taking practice of doing that, of being present as the present unfolds. But the, the way the body is involved is what gives you some hope for accuracy because your sensations are accurate. They are what they are. You can exaggerate thoughts to no limit, but you can't exaggerate the sensation of the breath in the nose. It's not that big a deal. And it fits your body, it's the right size. And the same with the sounds. They are what they are. It doesn't matter what you feel or what you like, what you don't like. The sound is just happens to be what it is. And that sort of calibrates the system to reality, to what real intensity is like. What is the unexaggerated intensity of sensation, of being really in my body in the moment? I'm breathing. I'm feeling the presence of the chair, the and even if I have chronic pain, I feel the pain. But it has its own intensity and it doesn't, you know, it may change over time, but it isn't as exaggeratable as thoughts are, you know. It is just what it is. So there's, a, there's something that is basically sane about mindfulness in that it doesn't depend upon your ideas about what should happen or what you prefer or what you dread, all of which color our experience very profoundly when we're not, you know, doing practices. It's just about what's happening now and what are the real sensations that are happening now. Now, this can be a little boring to someone who is more interested in the drama of their you know, cognitive, conceptual horror story about how they're being thwarted and how they're being mistreated and, or, you know, power plays and all of that stuff. Now, that isn't to take away from the fact that people certainly do become, they are mistreated at times and they ought to do something about it. And this is not trying to ignore it, but clarity will help you, will help you be effective in those circumstances, when there are transgressions, when this is not about some suppressive equanimity about just feel the breath and everything's gonna be fine. You can feel the breath and be unjustly imprisoned, you know, and you can still feel the breath, but that doesn't make it just that you're imprisoned and something should be done. And for the, for the sake of others who are unjustly imprisoned, you, need to do something, you know, but you want to have clarity that will allow you to take action and take care of these things. But aside from that, we all have our little personal dramas about, you know, I, I was just before we, we, we began, I was going through this thing again in my mind of this deal I made with somebody earlier in the year, and it was probably a mistake. I should have negotiated better or something like that. But oh my God, I was going into it all and the thing I should have said and, and all of that, you know, and it took a fraction, it took like five seconds, but I was all like in it. It was all like I had watched a whole episode of Netflix or something of this drama. And there's something really, there's something I want there there's something that feels attractive and sitting and feeling the breath is rather boring compared to all of that drama. But, you know, where is the value? Yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Um, can you address, like if you have a lot of pain, physical pain in your body? Yeah. 
with the mindfulness, you're feeling the sensation, but can you put more emphasis on another sensation? Yeah. When there's chronic pain, um, the feeling inside the body can be hard to do. You don't want to start there. You know, you don't want the interoceptive sensations because that's where the pain is. And so it can be hard. So there are other way, other things to try first, which is to uh, mindful walking, for example, mindful activity where you, be, you place your attention on the sensations of the activity, like washing the dishes. You pick up the plate, you feel the plate, you feel the water, you, you hear the squeak when it's clean, folding the laundry, walking. You can do that for a period of time so that while you're walking, you feel your feet as you're stepping, you see the visual field go by as you move forward. You hear the sounds, you know. And the goal with respect to chronic pain is that our attention, which can be very tight, can open and become bigger so that we have our full life and the pain also. You know, the pain is happening, but our other sensory experiences are happening too. So I will give you this. I don't know if I, I may have talked about this last time. I don't think I did. This is important and I'll just give it to you in a, in a short statement because it relates to what you're saying. When something important comes up and, our, and it captures our attention, our attention is becomes narrow and focused on the thing, you know? We are able to have a very tight attention and do it at will. Like if you wanna do your taxes and you know just get them done, you're gonna have narrow attention, you're going to exclude a lot of things, you're gonna focus and you're going to just do the thing that needs to be done until it's done and then you can relax your attention and be more open. Now, this tight attention, see, I'm like a tube, I'm looking through it. This tight attention is very valuable, but it's also exhausting and it is deprivational. You know, it's, it excludes so much of our experience. And what happens when people are anxious and troubled is they tend to go around moving a very tight attention from one thing to another. One troublesome thought, one problem, and they're just always, always, always going after things with this very concentrated, focused attention. Now, as I mentioned before, if a, if a bomb goes off on the sidewalk, that drives a tight attention, and that's good, it ought to, right? You want a focused attention. If you suddenly see somebody with a gun on the street, you're going to benefit from a very tight attention to that. But the trouble is our minds can drive that kind of tight attention too. So this is another way of giving that, and this relates to what Sylvia was saying, is what do you do with that intense thought that has captured your attention and now it is very tightly focused on it and you're sort of stuck with it for a while. Another way of expressing the instruction for mindfulness is, is you feel the breath, and then when you notice you're not feeling the breath, guaranteed it's because your tension has become tightly focused on something. Mm. Guaranteed. If, if, you're, if you're sitting and feeling your breath and then you're not feeling it, it's because your attention has been captured and has become tight because where's the breath? The breath didn't go anywhere. Your attention has moved away from it. You know, <laughs> your attention has become tight. Now, what people tend to do first is they drag their tight attention to the breath and then they experience the breath with the same kind of tight attention. And that's habitual, that's all right. Do it that way for a while, but you don't, that's not needed. What you do instead is when the tension is really tight, 
if you look at me, you relax the attention and then the breath is there. And so is the thought and so is the chronic pain, but it's open. You get, you get the vastness of the mind. And so there's room for the breath and for whatever the thought may be and for the chronic pain. And as you go, as this progresses, the pain may take center stage and get spotlighted and you become tight on the pain. And then you can learn that you can relax your attention and have a bigger experience where you haven't extinguished the pain, but there's room for the pain. It doesn't dominate your experience. It doesn't become the only thing you see, right? It's, it's funny, while we were doing this, I had a cramp go down my leg, one of those really, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh, cramp. <laughs> and I'm sitting here and I'm like, no, this cramp is not going to, you know, not going to take all of this meeting. I'm not going to get up and scream. And it was like, and it was, you know, like, just like you were saying, it's a tightness. And once you let go of that tightness and, and go somewhere else, it, it does open it up, you know? Yep. I see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is this something like when people used to uh, put a, a rubber band around their, uh, their uh, wrist and, and, and plunk it, you know? Well, that's what you do. That is a, that is a, uh, when people are in great distress and are really dominated by the distressing thoughts, that is a way of providing someone a more sharp sensation. And I've worked with people like this as a therapist, and they talk about that as being the distraction. I need to be distracted from my thoughts. But the fact is, the rubber band on your wrist, snap, that's your life. It's the thoughts that are the distraction. Yeah. You know, the sensation, the present yeah. sensation is your life. That's your life happening. The thought content is the distraction. Yeah. yeah, back when I was having panic attacks and I tried that rubber band thing, it was like, it was distracting for about half a second, then everything was back again. Of course, know? yeah. <laughs> it always does, it always does. But that's the thing, the, the, the mistake that can be made when these techniques are presented is to give people a different expectation. You know, the technique, the placement to be effective as a training, the placement only needs to last, you know, you just need to do it. You don't need to keep it. It's, it's not like you need to, like if, if this was my breath and this is my attention, my only, uh, all I need to do is place, touch it, just need to touch it and I'm done. Doesn't matter how long it stays at all. My job is not to grab it and to nail it in place. Mm -hmm. That requires a lot of thinking and we're not doing that. All I do is place, touch it. I just touch it. And then I notice that I'm not touching it and then I touch it again and then, I, then I'm not. And then I touch it. That's the practice because it's the choice to touch, that is what you're learning. Staying on the breath is not what you're learning. You're learning to choose and to have effect, you know, to actually be able to touch. Once you develop that ability, the mind calms down dramatically over time. And then the duration of, you know, time that you're not getting dragged away just naturally reduces because all the intensity of everything goes down. Yeah. I wanted to share something and see what you thought about a, a practice that I had used for a while. Um, you know, like, I think it was Einstein that said, you can't 
change the problem with the same mentality that got you there. And you know, if your mind is is consciousness, honey. If your mind is prone to wandering, um, a practice that we would do is we would do, uh, take ten minutes, have a candle that was lit, set a timer for ten minutes, and every time we noticed our, our mind start wandering, we would make a mark. Now that candle is the thought that you want to think. And when your mind starts wandering, you make the mark. And that makes you physically aware my mind is wandering. So you're training yourself to focus on what you want to think. And we got where we're at by tr basically training ourselves or repeating, going through habitual thoughts of getting that monkey mind. And there are several other exercises that we do. And it was a non-judgmental thing because you, know, you can make a mark and at the end of 10 minutes, you could have one mark and that could either mean that you were so focused, you only had one distraction or that your mind was wandering the entire time and you only noticed once. Yeah. It has to be non-judgmental. It has to be with the... Talking about, it's in practice. You can't... Right. Practice. So as I mentioned... History. Yeah, as I mentioned... Um, when the mind is very active, very busy, you, you may want a more busy practice. And what you're describing is one of the more busy practices one can do. Because in response to a thought, you take an action and you do something and then you, you know. Now, it's, you wanna be careful about busy practices because they can get so busy that they're not practice at all. They're just sort of chasing yourself around and policing yourself, which is sort of can be a neurotic way of trying to practice, you know? Well, so you want to start, start that way. And then after a while that you start noticing, then you take away the paper and the pencil. And just when you notice your mind and it's about noticing it without any judgment. Um, yeah. Yeah. Are all involved just recall or focusing on an image that you want to make hold. Sure. And um, so you're, you're expressing the same thing I am, which is the less busy practice is closer to the fruition, which is mindfulness that is not effortful, that is not uh, deliberate, but is just being present. But if the mind is so busy that you need a rubber band to even know you're there, by all means, get a rubber band and remind yourself that you're actually physically here in this chair and you're not being like blown around the universe in these thought storms, you know? And likewise, these other practices too. The thing that I'm warning you about is that um, <clears throat> we may think we need something more busy than we do because the mind wants busy. Uh, and the ego, the, the, the ego which is distorted and is built up of this habit of these acquired habits about what I need and who I am and what people do to me and what I need, you know, all of that, dis these distortions that we have can be quite happy to let you practice for a little while and just wait till you're done and then resume, you know? So a busy practice can be very supportive to uh, a neurotic process because it's sort of like, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, now you're done and all right, you know. Well, the biggest thing it did for me is that it gave me a greater ability to wear, become aware of when my thoughts are wandering. Uh, exactly. A right. lot of times I didn't have, and that was, that was, that was the intention of behind it. Right. If you, if you sit down with the intention of just getting through it, that you're wasting your time. Right, if the mind is too busy, there's, you know, there's sitting, and calling it practice doesn't make practice happen. You know, that's one of the reasons why it's useful to have people uh, be with you in a teaching around these things because people can can think that they're meditating or think that they're doing mindfulness and following something that they read, and you know, never even get to the point like I did with Kathy of like being sure that what you're placing your attention on is sensation. Like it's the actual feeling that that's, it's the sensation that we're after. If you do mindfulness without sensation, you're just being, you're just thinking. 
you know, you're just thinking and it's not going to get you anywhere. But someone has to really ask you and get you to answer and get, you know, bring that point home, you know. So this isn't so, that you, you can't really learn this stuff from a book and then just do it. You're more likely to just sort of flavor, give your neurotic processes some kind of mindful flavor and uh, be more mindfully neurotic <laughs> and become more efficiently neurotic maybe, you know. Mindfully neurotic. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to do, it's easy to do. So well, it's, Michael, I have a, oh, yeah? sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go. Um, I um, had a question back on uh, the subject of, of pain and right. mindfulness uh, that you were responding to Kathy about, and I, and I found that very interesting, but um, <clears throat> you, you must surely be um, familiar with John Kabat-Zinn, right? Yeah. Um, and so, but am, am I mistaken? I thought that he, when he works with people with pain, um, that that is that what he actually does is that he actually takes them into focusing directly on their pain. Can you explain that a little bit, or 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 you know, put talk about both of those things? How you answered, Kathy, yeah. and then the the fruition, the end result that John Cabot Sim would like, and that I would like, is that your experience of the pain not be dominated and restricted to the pain, that there be an artificial, you know, if you feel pain, the pain can come so close that you can't see anything else. You can't experience anything else. And that amplifies the suffering of the pain. Right. The pain hasn't changed in intensity in terms of nociception, in terms of the actual nervous system operation of pain sensation. But it's an attentional process that it becomes so dominant. Now, part of what he does in that respect is one of the things that people can do as a way of trying to cope with pain when they don't know how to cope well with pain is they they try to ignore it and suppress it. And they try to pretend it is not happening. And they think that that mechanism is going to help them. And part of, and what he's doing in that, what you described is bring the pain into the allowable experience so that it becomes okay to have the pain because you do, you have it. So, as a technique, it may involve deliberately focusing on the pain as a way of showing yourself that it's not going to kill you, that it has a certain intensity, that it is really there. And so that can be corrective as part of the path toward the ultimate goal, which is you have the pain, but it doesn't dominate your life, right? Because if you, a lot of people who have pain devote a lot of energy and sort of spinning, they spin so that they don't feel it, so that they think they're evading, avoiding the feeling of it. Mm. And so in that case, you want to let people uh, focus on the pain on purpose so that it becomes uh, acceptable, you know, because yeah. there's no choice. There's no choice about accepting. And because, uh, you know, not accepting doesn't give you anything, doesn't do anything. So does that make sense to you in terms yes. of a, a sequence? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank okay. you. Thank you. Anybody You're else have a question or anything? That was really amazing. I really learned a lot. I really appreciate that. And we are going to try that in our lives. It'll be good. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael, for- You're welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you, Michael. Yeah.
We'll, we'll be uh, reaching out to you once again, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. All right. I know you've been, you've been on Zoom all morning, so we uh -huh. will let you rest and you stay. All right. Take these things, things off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thanks for being here. <laughs> okay. That was interesting. That's mm -hmm. so totally different of what I thought it was. So, learned a lot. Um, I glad you have that connection, Kathy. Yeah, he's. He's, yeah, he's like my brother. I grew up with, in his house <laughs> for years and years. So, and there's still, there was five of them. So, um, it was good. Uh, I have some news. Um, tomorrow is the International Day of Peace. And I'd like to do something for that day uh, the International Day of Peace was established in 1981 by the United Nations and uh, the General Assembly. And two decades later, in 2001, the General Assembly unanimously voted to designate September 21st as a period of nonviolence and any kind of cease fires. So churches and everything all over the globe are having all kinds of different things uh, that you could really tap into if you just Google it. And CSL uh, is doing meditations. A lot of the centers are doing a meditation. And I'd like to just do a simple meditation on peace tomorrow about one o'clock. It should only take maybe 20, 30 minutes. We're gonna meditate for 10 minutes on peace and they sent us a whole um, outline that we could do. So we're gonna do the Zoom, the same Zoom that we're on now. We're gonna do that tomorrow at one o'clock if anybody would like to join me. Uh, also, the Deep, deep Red Chopras, we, we mentioned it last meeting and um, he's doing He's doing this program. It's a global universal movement on healing. And it's called Never Alone. And if you want to Google that, it, it's a whole big thing on Never Alone. It's trying to get um, help to anybody that has emotional issues. And it's tapping into the whole global community that people can get its assistance and help. And it's called Never Alone. And um, let's see, where is it? You can go to never, neveralone.love. And it's a grassroots movement that aims to create community-led organizations around the world to help people in emotional distress who need community support. And it's being funded through a GoFundMe campaign. And right now, it surpassed all the original goals they had. So it's a very interesting concept, and it's, it's wonderful. So if you want to check that out, that's called Never Alone. And my other thing is I ordered this book we were talking about, Love Yourself Like Your Life Depended On It. So I sent out the link to Amazon for that. It's about $14, $15. So I just got it, haven't read it yet, but I will let you know. And, um, oh, and so we are working on phase one of the CSL uh, to become a teaching chapter. And we're almost done, thanks to Paul and Ann. And I just wanted, to um, put it out there that we are going to be needing a leadership council. So if anybody wants to be part of that and help us grow this, please let us know because we're gonna be completing, we have 60 days from when we finish phase one to go to phase two. So that's gonna be coming up very shortly, uh, phase two. 
And I wanted to thank everybody for their donations and sending me checks and uh, for donating on PayPal. It's really nice to see the support we're getting from everyone. And if anybody has any subjects or any person that they're interested in uh, that they would like to share uh, that I could check out and we could have, you know, um, on our Zoom meetings, just let me know that too. And I think, I think that's all the news I have, unless anybody else has news they want to share. Any news anybody else wants to share with us? This is related to uh, Sites of Mind, but on October the 8th at the center, they're going to have a shredding truck there. Uh -huh. So all those old things that you have that have your numbers and in personal in information, I think you could do, um, let me see, wait, I had it a while ago. You could do uh, five grocery bags for five dollars. Okay. And Say what that again? What is that, uh, Sylvia? I didn't understand what you could bring to the center. Uh, anything that you have, you know, paper work. Anything you want shredded. Oh, shredded. 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 Oh, okay. That you want okay. shredded. Okay. Five bags for five dollars. Okay. And what day was that? October eighth. Uh huh. And they moved now, right? They're in the new location, the same? Yes, uh-huh, on Belvedere. Okay. And you just drive up, give them your bags, and they shred it right there. And it's quick and efficient. Great, great. I have a funny story about that. When I lived in Asheville, I, decide, I was moving, I decided to burn everything in my backyard, you know, all my important documents. And my neighbor called the police and the fire trucks came and all. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it was really. Well, if you live in the city, you're not allowed to burn outside. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. It was, it was, you know, it was what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Another embarrassing moment. <laughs> did, yeah. did you get a citation? No. No, just it's an embarrassment, in my, you know. You you didn't know mindfulness back then. You could just breathe now, the cool air in your nose, and that's it. It was a very different feeling when you open your eyes, though, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It was more yeah. calming to me. Yeah, I I didn't think I thought my head would go you know crazy when I opened my eyes, but it wasn't. It was mm -hmm. I didn't understand whether he wanted you to breathe the air in your nose and breathe out through your mouth or through your nose again. No, that, that matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. doesn't matter. Okay, it didn't matter. Just breathe naturally. You're just being aware of the way your okay. body naturally okay. breathes and what's you're, going on and stuff. And, and you're mostly you're being aware of the sensation. Yeah. You, you don't have to force your body to do anything. You just want to know what you're feeling. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Being aware. And, and the whole point of that is that the sensation is inherently in the now. Mm -hmm. What he right. said. You know, you are, when you're focused on the sensations, you are inherently focused on the what is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is this. All right. Shall we do it? Thank you. Um, you want to do a, a song, Jane, or our blessed always, and then okay, and then I'll uh, I'll do a closing prayer. All righty, <clears throat> everybody ready? Yep. Uh, might want to mute yourselves. Yeah, we might okay. want to mute ourselves. <laughs> or we could have the <laughs> the rolling song. <laughs> okay. Blessed always, blessed always, for the arms of God surround us. Let our joy be so triumphant that we rest in God and say amen. 
Blessed always, blessed always for the arms of God surround us. Let our joy be so triumphant that we rest in God and say amen that we rest in God and say amen. Thank you, Jane. And I know as we go through this week, we are powerful, powerful spiritual beings. And I know we are who we have come here to be. With hearts open wide, we see the world through the eyes of love. And I, as we go through this week, especially tomorrow, let's know and think and feel peace and health and freedom and send it all over the world. And also send it to all these people that are involved in the fires and the hurricanes. There's so much going on in the world today with the unjustness and everything. And let's just send our energy and our consciousness out to each and every one involved in this. And they know they are wrapped in love just like we are wrapped in love. And we are blessed and we are safe and we are free. So thank you all for coming. I love you. Enjoy your week. Thank you. And I hope to see some of you tomorrow on Zoom for a short meditation. Maybe some mindfulness too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, we'll, Kathy. We'll open the Zoom about 15 minutes ahead of time. Okay. I'd love to come, but I'm going to be at work, so. I know. Okay. Well, time. just think about it. All, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's a whole day, and it's all over the world. So if we just want to add our energy to that, and the more people that do it, the better it is. Okay, okay. Kathy. Thank you. Okay. Nice to see everybody. Bye. So, uh, Kathy, thanks for the reminder. I don't know where I got it in my mind that it was one thirty. <laughs> I was like, please, Jane. <laughs> Jane should be up by now. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I wouldn't want to miss a minute of his uh, his sharing. He's he's so wonderful. Yeah, he really he's, he's so smart and he's he's very and a very good teacher. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't drive a car. Is that why? Really? He lives in Manhattan and doesn't drive. Oh, okay, well that makes oh, sense. Oh, a car is a liability yeah, in Manhattan. You don't want one there. <laughs> San Francisco, Manhattan, yeah. You but know, I've, thousands of dollars just to park the silly thing. I know, but weddings and everything, he has to take buses and trains, you know, trains, planes, everything. It's, you know, I've but, done several, uh, uh, computer consulting engagements in in Manhattan yeah. and I've always just you know I would fly into LaGuardia and get a taxi into town and then it was all I didn't even really use the buses because the subway always got me within a block or two of where I wanted to go. My girlfriend that lives here pays more rent for her car than her apartment. Yeah it's yeah. that's you know what what I would do because I generally would come in on Monday and then leave Friday. So I would get a week uh, pass for the subway, for the Metro. I could have used it on the subway or the buses, but I get a week pass. My, pe my friends that live there, they say, you can't believe how many people are moving out of New York City. Oh, really? Unbelievable. She said, there's just moving trucks everywhere. Every they really go down. Yeah, it's from the COVID. The virus. The virus. The they, COVID, they're, yeah. They're going into the countries and, and the suburbs and everything. They're, yeah. They're realizing that that being all crammed together yeah. is, uh, is how this stuff spreads, which is, in fact, the way it spreads. It's the... Um, the, uh, I guess. the you, you have to have fresh air. I mean, if you... Yeah. If you have combined air source, then that's the way it gets spread. Yeah. And, you know, like the apartment buildings, the, your apartment 
I think the typical apartment in in uh, Manhattan, they you know they don't have air conditioning. If you want air conditioning, you put a window unit in the window, and I think the heat is probably like steam heat or something like that. But uh, but still, you know, you have to go out into the hallway. In the elevator. In the elevator. And, yeah, in, in yeah. the hallway and the elevator. And if anybody that's been infected has been in that hallway or in the elevator, it's going to linger in that air for hours and hours. So, um, yeah, that's, they're, they're realizing that this is not a healthy thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So the ones that can will, and the ones that can't, well, there won't be as many of them. <laughs> My brother lives in Wilmington, Vermont. And the house values there have tripled. Wow. The, 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 um, I've seen that in Vermont. The, <laughs> the real estate market right here is hot as can be. Yeah. But, you know, it's not just that they're moving out of New York City. They're in moving DC. out of D.C. as well. Any cities, really. Any, yeah, any, city. any, any high-density city, people are yeah. realizing, hmm, maybe this is not such a good thing. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, when when uh, when I would go doing this uh, uh, engagement there, I'd get one of those week passes, and you know it's like usually I'm picking it up on. Uh, there may be somebody knocking at the door. It it'd be a week pass. I'd buy it, you know, either Sunday night or Monday, and use it through Friday. And then Friday, when I was getting ready to leave, I'd give it to my client and say, "Hey, this has got a couple days left on it. You might as well use it." Yeah. I can't imagine going on a train either. That's a horror. That would be really oh. waiting on the train and going in this train with all these people. No. Yeah. Okay. People at the door. Anything else, anybody? Yeah. I'll okay. leave the Zoom up. There's people at the door. I'm going to go see what's going on. Hey, Paul, are you, are you and Ann coming into town later today like you usually do? Uh, We might. Why? I'll give it. Give me a call. We can okay. Grab something to eat or something. If, if we do, it'll be dinner time. Yeah. All right. Bye, bye, Bob. Bye, Tom. Bye. Bye, Tom. Glad you had your other half with you today. Yes. That was <laughs> nice to see Kat. Please tell her to join us again. <laughs> and we even had a few. We had up to fifteen people today. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty good. All right. Thanks, Jane. Thanks. Bye-bye. Come on, in the end. Come on, in the end.